Let's go ahead and get that light back there, big guy. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Children, yeah, you got to remind me of that kind of stuff. Sarah, you have the minds of the future church in your possession. So.
Genesis 22. This is another story of Abraham. Genesis 22, verses, uh, verses going to start verse 1. It came about after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. What was Abraham's name before it was Abraham? Amen. So now that it was Abraham, what does that mean? It means that covenant was made. It means that God has made covenant with Abraham. So this story takes place after the covenant has been made. Verse 2, now take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, go to the land of Moriah, <laughs> offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I will tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his yoke. Now, hold on a minute. Do you think there was a conversation with Sarah between verse 2 and verse 3? <laughs> no. no. You don't think mom knew?
How did you get out of the house uh, to take? Yeah, it's, it's wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. So, verse 3, Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son, and he split wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. These are some of the specific undertakings that you can expect to find in a covenantal relationship with God. Four, verse 4, on the third day, Abraham raised his eyes and saw the place from a distance. On what day did Abraham raise his eyes? Third day. Any significance to that? Okay, in Exodus 3, Exodus 3, you, you can flip around to all of these if you want to. Uh, Exodus 3, verse 18, I believe. Let me make sure I'm on it there. This was uh, Moses trying to get permission to, to let the, from Pharaoh, get the, it's the whole story of Moses and going to Egypt and that kind of thing. And this is the Lord kind of giving him the rundown of, of what he's going to do in Egypt. Uh, so in verse 18 it says, They will pay heed to what you say, and you with the elders of Israel will come to the king of Egypt, and you will say to him, The Lord, the God of the Hebrews, has met with us. So now... Please let us go a three days journey into the wilderness that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. So uh, I, I would love to sing the Let My People Go song to you right now because it's a lot of fun. When Moses first went to Egypt, or first went to Pharaoh to ask, he wasn't asking to let my people go as Disney has spun the tale. What he was asking is that can we all go have a worship service three days journey into the wilderness? So three days has a significance not only from Abraham's day, but to Moses' day. In Exodus 19, in Exodus 19, Moses is on uh, Mount Sinai, and in verse 10, the Lord says to Moses, Go to the people and consecrate them, Today and tomorrow. What does consecrate mean? Make holy. Make holy. Consecrate them today and tomorrow. Let them wash their garments. Let them be ready for the third day. For on the third day, the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. Can you imagine being in that position? Hey, make yourself holy. Go pray out whatever you've got to pray out. Go cleanse yourself because in three days, the Lord is going to show up on that mountain where all of you would be. <coughs> Hosea 6. Hosea 6. Now, if you can find Hosea fast, uh, if you're flipping through, you know your Bible. Hosea 6, 1 through 2. Now, this is, uh, this is the response um, to, to the Lord's uh, rebuke of the people. So the... Um, Come, let us return to the Lord, for he has torn us, but he will heal us. He has wounded us, but he will bandage us. Now, anybody sitting in this room and not sitting in one of the big, wonderful, air-conditioned cathedrals that's in Hutchinson understands what it's like to be wounded, understand what it's like to be damaged by life, and understand that conversation that you have with the Lord where it's almost like you're bargaining, where you start to say things like, all right, Lord, I deserve this. I, just, I did it, I deserve it, but can I make a deal with you? Everybody has found themselves in that spot in the wee hours of the morning. This is that kind of spot that Hosea, uh, that, that's being recorded here in Hosea. He has wounded us, but he will bandage us. He will revive us after two days. He will raise us up on the third day that we may live before him. So even prophetically, the third day had some significance. Um, anybody remember the story of Jonah? How many days in the belly of the beast? Three days. What happened after three days? He got spit out. Oh, see, you guys think you're in church. See, you said spit out. He got vomited onto the beast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What kind of sign did Jesus? 
Jesus say was the only kind of sign people would have of him. Sign of Jonah. He said, like Jonah was in the belly of the beast for three days, I will be in the belly of the earth for three days. And after three days, the earth is going to vomit me back up to you. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, Paul says, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. That he was buried, he was raised on the third day. Third day. What? day was it that Jesus started his ministry at a wedding? It was the third day of the week. The third day of the week. It was the third day of the week. When they talked about the temple, when Jesus talked about the temple being torn down and it freaked out the Sadducees and the Pharisees, Jesus said what about that temple? If you tear that temple down, I'm going to rebuild it in is there significance in three days? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Anytime the scripture is going to talk about three days, what you can expect is lightning to fall on that third day. You can expect a miracle to happen on the third day. You can expect a major movement of God on that third day. So when we go back to Genesis 22, and they're kind of laying out the significance of what the third day is going to mean. And so on the third day, Abraham raised his eyes and saw the place from a distance. Now, God came and spoke to Abraham. Abraham spoke to his son. There was obviously a conversation with Sarah in there that's not recorded. Okay? And then they're on, it talks about what they're taking for provisions, and they're on their way. And on the third day of their journey, there's no reason to say, hey, at some point along the way in the journey, Abraham raised his eyes and saw the place. Unless you're trying to mark, that was the third day. That was the third day. Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey. I and the lad will go over there and we will worship and return to you. Moses said, let my people go. that We may go up to the wilderness and worship. Abraham said, stay here. Going to take the boy and we're going to go worship. Abraham took the wood burnt offering and he laid it on Isaac, his son, and he took in his hand the fire and the knife, and the two of them walked on together. What does that say about Isaac? He knew. What's that? He's big enough to carry wood. He's big enough to carry wood. Um, Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, My father. And, and Abraham said, here I am, son. And he said, uh, got the fire, got the wood, where's the lamb for the burnt offering? What does that say about Isaac? Right, no. Isaac understood how this burnt offering stuff worked. He would probably helped his dad make burnt offering before. Now, Isaac wasn't a grown man. Isaac was a lad, is how he is described. I can't help but think this is that father's son's here. Okay, I'm talking to you guys. Ladies, be quiet. This is the age where you teach your kid how to throw a curveball. This is the age where you teach him how to bait his own hook and take the fish off by himself. This is the age where you teach him how to change oil and the tire on the pickup truck. This is that age where they ain't a man, but you can see the man that they're going to become. And you start trying to pour in all of those little things that you want to get in there, that you want it, the fingerprints that you want to leave on the boy, you're trying to get in. And usually there's this, this, this very finite pocket of time where that son thinks his dad is the man. And you try to pour all in right there. Abraham said to Isaac, God will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering. the lamb for the burnt offering. It's kind of a new thought to think about Christ on the cross being the burnt offering. They came 
came to the place which God had told him, and Abraham built the altar there, arranged the wood, and bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar. stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. <clears throat> I don't know what to think about all that. I, it seems like there would be more conversation than what's recorded. I'm sure there was. <clears throat> but I can't get past the fact that Isaac was Isaac was at that place in his life where he thought his dad was the man. I mean, his dad walked with God. And now he finds himself bound. And it reminds me of my own life. It reminds me of your life and the stories that I heard, the stories that I know. Do we still trust God when we feel bound? When we can't get out? When, when there doesn't seem to be, a, when my daughter is in the mental health room with no pictures, no windows, no way out, a TV screen that has layers of plastic on it so that somebody doesn't break it, so when you turn it on, all it's got is the cartoon channel. Now, some of y'all might think that's pretty cool, but she doesn't. When you feel bound, can you still feel the when you feel like there's no way out, can you still tell that God is there? Or have you believed the lies of the devil where the devil's convincing you this is God's fault that you're bound? You realize our Christian walk is all predicated on which voice of spirit are we listening to? Are we listening to Holy Spirit or are we listening to evil spirit? Because we're always listening to spirit. Well, Pastor, how do you know which one it is? That's what this book is about. The more you start to understand God and covenant and his relationship and his love for us, the more you can tell who's lying to you in your head and who's telling you the truth in your head. Angel Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham, do not stretch out your hand against the lad and do nothing to him, for now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. In the Old Testament, in, in, in the Aramaic and the Hebrew, oftentimes when it, it says angel of the Lord, and it's in, uh, we see it again in Joshua, when Joshua crossed over the Jordan and they, the angel of the Lord came and then there was the captain of the Lord's army and all this kind of, these things are regarded as pre-Messianic visions. In other words, angel of the Lord is code for Jesus just showed up. So, Jesus just showed up and said to Abraham, don't kill me. feelings a Christian has is when you fail the test and you realize you failed. And you know you failed. You know, that's just even speaking. You know you failed. It's hard. It's hard. And, and when you love somebody and you watch them fail it, you know, and then you watch them try to sell it off as something else and you realize they're listening to the wrong voice! And they're not going to take your advice. They're not going to it's so much easier to hide than it is to change. It's so much easier to run than it is to stand up. You can't be that. You can't be that. It's interesting. 
me that, that God tested Abraham after he faced up with Abraham. And his test was, Abraham, are you willing to do what I'm willing to do? I'm willing to send my only begotten son. Are you willing to give yours? Are you willing to do what I'm willing to do? Abraham passed the test, therefore he's the patriarch of our faith. He's what Paul refers to in Galatians chapter 3 when he says, if you are a man or a woman of faith, then, then, then Abraham is your forefather. He's the beginning of that. Now the fact that he tested said, no, I'm not willing to sacrifice my son. Does that mean the picture of our faith might be like Bob? <laughs> I mean, it, 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 but Abraham did say yes. Abraham did follow the principle. <clears throat> Just because God has made covenant with us doesn't mean that your testing days are over. It means you're just getting started. It means that God is preparing you for the very thing that he called you for, and he's not going to give you, what's the hardest test out there? MCATs? Let's have a doctor test. <laughs> Brian, what's the, hardest, what's the hardest test out there? What do lawyers take? What's that called? The bar. The bar? Okay, let's just say that's the, that's the hardest. You're not going to start with the bar. You're going to start with fourth grade math. So as, as you progress in your faith, think of it in terms of schooling. you got to pass elementary school before you get to junior high. you got to pass junior high before you get to high school. you got to pass high school before you get into college and any kind of advanced learning that, that the Lord may have intended for you. Now, here's the thing. The Lord needs us all. The Lord needs us all. He doesn't need all of us to have passed the bar. But he needs us all to fulfill the very thing. Ready for the tests. Take the tests. Have a perspective of what this is and pass the test. Pass the test. Pass the test. Listen to the correct voice of the Spirit in your head. Does that make sense? I know that's like a little side thing. So here's a question. I know we're talking about what are the terms of our covenant. Is sacrifice part of the terms of the covenant for us today? Yes. 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 Very much so. Very much so. Abraham was willing to do what God was willing to do, which was sacrifice his son. Therefore, he's a patriarch of our faith. But what about us? Is God asking us, Rod and I were talking about a little bit before church, is God asking us to sacrifice our kids, sacrifice our sons? And I'm saying, no, he's not. This is the new covenant. This is what makes the covenant now new. What was that? Uh, what was that thing that kind of hit hit the Christianity by storm uh, uh, four, five, six, seven years ago? Uh, w W. What does that mean? Well, what, does that mean? Well, what does that mean? Are we supposed to emulate God or Jesus? That you all been taught that, right? Uh, growing up, we've always heard, "Hey, if you want to be more like Jesus." Nobody said, hey, you want to be more like God the Father. No, 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 that, no. We don't have that role. You want to be more like Jesus. Jesus didn't sacrifice his son. Jesus sacrificed himself. himself. Are you tracking with me? <clears throat> Are we willing to do what Jesus was willing to do, and that sacrifice ourselves? Now, hold on a minute. I'm not calling for any BS, self-mutilation, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> Okay, that's not what I mean. It's not what I mean at all. This is about our hearts. This is about our desires. This is about what it is that we love. So the terms we accepted when we accepted Christ is to love him with all of our being. <clears throat> that is a sacrificial surrender. You are. 
somebody's sin, the, the thing that you can see, brother, and I'm, 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 I'm just pointing randomly, okay, nobody take anything personally, that guy's a thief, it's easy to point something out when you can see it, oh, that guy, you know, he cheated on his wife all the time, I mean, you, it's easy to point that, we're talking about this, the terms of the covenant weren't about how it manifests, the terms of the covenant are about right here. Everybody in this room or out there on our cool veranda is guilty of this isn't right. It's kind of right. But remember, we're called to righteousness, not right-ishness. So, remember that passage where the Lord said to Peter, do you love me? And Peter said, yes, Lord. Peter, do you love me? Peter said, yes, Lord. You know, Lord, this is the second time you asked me this. Take care of my lambs. He asked him the third time, right? Peter, do you love me? Every time Peter answered that question, what Jesus asked him to do was to sacrifice himself to take care of others. That's the story of Jesus. That's now our story. Bear Jesus' name, we bear that mantra. Does that make sense? Can you hit that like your big color? We're going to play a song, uh, sing it if you want, pray through it if you want. Uh, we have the pieces of paper up here if you want to write your request and put them in the wall. You can certainly do that. But uh, uh, take the time. Take the time. All right? Ask the Lord for the courage that we need. Love him the way he loves us. Amen? Amen. There is a mountain in between what you have said and what I see Standing before this offering My failing heart will fight to believe but On this altar, on this road You have called me from my home The weight I carry Is not my own Spirit move this heart of the stone How can I walk in my new name Father of many The promise you gave on this altar and on this road, I lay 
mountain I have climbed Wrestling doubts that flood my mind When ashes and dust are all that remain We'll hope for the world still come from my veins On this altar and on this road You have called me from my home The weight I carry is not my own Spirit move this heart of stone And how can I walk in my new name Father of many the promise you gave on this altar and on this road I lay down my flesh and